Welcome to Belkin's Growth Podcast, hosted by Michael Maximoff, co-founder and managing partner at Belkin's. Today's guest is James Muir, author of the bestseller, The Perfect Close, The Secret to Closing Sales. Keynote speaker and veteran sales executive. With 30 years of healthcare experience, James has a passion for healthcare IT. Michael and James talk about B2B pitfalls that sellers trap into, why it is dangerous to rely only on sales techniques, and when and why companies fail in creating their value propositions. Enjoy listening. The reason why I asked Dmitry to set up this call is that the team and I are focusing on, on being very good in lead generation. So we are you know, working hard, reading a lot of books, learning a lot of practices, and kind of wanting to maximize our value to our clients from the lead generation perspective, right? But sure. what we've seen a lot of time is that those that are closing, right? Those on the client side that wanted to, to close deals are not that good, right? So what I want to understand from the practitioner like yourself is what I can pass to my clients so that they can be better at what they're doing, right? And how I want to build this this conversation with you is that first, I wanted to better understand how did you start with sales? Because I've seen that you've been in sales for like 20 years now and you first started as a salesperson at NextGen Healthcare, right? That's not even right. That's not even right. I've been in sales for about 30 years. I started as an operations person in a revenue cycle, family-owned revenue cycle business. And I got drafted into sales because they opened up an office in a location where they had to have someone who could run the business, but also have to go sell. Prior to that, I actually, I would go with the salespeople on their meetings to answer hard questions. I remember thinking, man, I hope I never have to do that. (laughs) And then what do you know? Here I am, you know, in sales. And it turns out that was the best place for me, actually or what I am. But yeah, so I've been in sales even longer than it looks like on my LinkedIn profile. I don't so know why. So what was I the ticking point when you decided... So you, you were in operation, right? And then you moved like to being a full-time salesperson, sales executive, right? What, yep. what changed in your mind? Where you would decided saying, that, okay, I want to dedicate uh, my time into that, into being better in, in this craft? <laughs> well, that also was a crisis. So... I thought I was eventually going to be able to run that office and show everybody how great a manager I was going to be. Yeah. And what happened is our, uh, we had acquired another business and their number one sales guy left and took a whole bunch of clients with him. So I went from having to manage and do a little bit of selling to doing all sales. And there was a ton of pressure associated with that too, because it was like, hey, if, we, if you don't bring in business, we're going to have to shut down this whole office and all these people are going to lose their job. It wasn't what I signed up for. And so I just learned from the hard way. And I, I did not know how to sell at that time. And so I started scouring books and reading all these different things to try to figure out. And the problem that I had is that I had tons of opportunities in my pipeline, but they weren't ever closing. And so my pipeline was just really bloated. And so I started reading all these different books. If you name a book on closing, I've probably read the, that book. And I tried some of these tactics and some of them backfired very badly, very bad. I lost a really, really, really big account that we already had by practicing one of these bad closing techniques on one of our existing clients. Anyway, it was through the school hard knocks, but that's how I, the whole book, Perfect Close, is essentially, it originated with me trying to solve my own closing problem, which is how do I get, and I, I stumbled upon that by accident. I was talking to a client. I'm, I needed to get some business in and we were going to be in really big trouble. And so th- this client was, very gun shy. They'd already been burned by another rev cycle company and they didn't know what was wrong inside their organization. So we can know exactly what happened. And they said, yes. And I'm like, okay. So I did all this homework for them, right? There was a lot of extra sweat equity involved in getting that deal. But what I learned is that later I was reflecting what, what made them say yes to that when nobody else was saying yes. And it was just that little phrase that doesn't make sense. That's the thing that got me doing that. And so later when I started managing my own teams, I sort of tricked out that whole process and made it even better than it is. But I suffered a lot like a lot of other salespeople with a whole bunch of deals that are in my pipeline, but none of them were going over the finish line. I couldn't get them closed. And so that whole thing was uh, my personal journey from not knowing how to sell at all and move deals across the pipeline to be able to get every deal closing and always moving forward. What was the trick that you wanted to, to try out, the sales trick that you wanted to try that works or not? Oh. What, when you failed the account, do you still remember that? Yeah, I used an alternate choice close on them. 
And here's what the guy said to me. He, I mean, like everything was going fine up to that moment. And then when I used this alternate choice closing on him, he's pushed back from the table and he got this look on his face like he just ate something bad. And he goes, if you think that you're going to get this deal just because we're already an existing client, you are wrong. And he looked at me. And so he knew immediately I was doing a, a sales tactic on him. And that really offended him. And he proved it to me too. We, he was already a client for one part of our business and we were trying to get him to be a client for another part of the line of business that we had. And he was pissed. When I used that alternate choice close, it, an assumptive close basically, he said, if you are assuming that, that you think you're going to get this business just because we're already a client, you're wrong with that. And he proved me wrong. He actually bought a worse product for more money than our product was. He, he actually, to just to prove a point, he bought the other guy's stuff, even though it was a, a, a worse choice for him. So. I learned, okay, and most of those books that you read that have these closing tactics, they're all, a um, right. ton of them are timeshare related, meaning mm-hmm. I've got a really big ticket item, I need to sell it, and I can only sell it in one encounter. And that's not how most of us sell. Most of those tactics are all very dysfunctional selling tactics. And so obviously what I wrote about in my book is just how to do that in a way that's non-confrontational, it's no pressure. And it makes the customer feel like they're in control. And it's more effective. It's far more effective. That's what the data shows, actually, is that all these other techniques actually backfire. So you'll be more successful if you don't try to push the customers. Right. That alternate choice close, right? Can you explain what the technique is about? Is it just yeah. giving the, you take this or you take that or you yeah. have two options yeah. on the table, which one is works for you? And then he said, no, I, I don't want any of that. Yeah, yeah. So... For those who are listening that don't know what an alternate choice clause is, it is where you give them two options, both of options, which are you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so that would be like, hey, do you want to you buy the green car or the red car? Either way, you're buying a car, right? Or more commonly when we're making appointments, and it's less risky when you're asking for an appointment, is do you want to schedule something for Tuesday or Thursday, right? And so the truth is an alternate choice clause can work. I've used it actually quite a few times. But what the data shows is the bigger the opportunity gets, the less effective it is. And so when you're selling things that are tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars, then you can't use these old tactics. That's what the data shows. And what uh, the data also shows is that it it damages the, the trust relationship with the client, like it happened to me with my client. And so there was a study done, this is a long time ago, of B2B customers, and they studied six different a closing tactics. And in fact, if I look here closely, I could probably tell you the exact closing tactics that they use. Alternate choice is one of them. But what they found is that every case, every, every closing tactic damaged trust. And the ones that were the most manipulative damaged trust the most. And so the takeaway is that in the B2B selling space, when you're selling things that are above 500 bucks, you can't use these, you can't use these uh, tactics. And so that's a, a challenge is because a brand new sales rep they want to learn how to close, they probably just Google it. But what they're going to find is all these tactics that were invented you know, in the late 20s when people sold items that were very... You know, salespeople sold very cheap items. And so uh, they don't actually work for the kinds of sales that most of us do today, especially a, a B2B or a high-tech sale like yours. Right. And when you have a sales cycle is stretched and you need to invest 12 months into building relationships with clients rather than rely on all your hopes on one or two calls and a few techniques, right? So yes. what would be th- top three failed sales techniques that, uh, that salespeople are currently still using, uh, especially the beginners? <laughs> well, I wrote a whole... In fact, there's a free report on my website called The Seven Deadly Sins of Closing. Seven. It, yeah. So there's a bunch of myths. I call them myths. The first of those actually is just that they even work. Neil Rackham actually studied that and they found that those that were, had the most faith in these closing gambits, I call them, were actually 21% less effective than those who did. But the one that everybody knows that is actually wrong is the always be closing, right? And so uh, thanks to uh, Alec Baldwin and Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross, we all know always be closing and it's so memorable, right? But yeah. what the data actually shows is that past the first attempt to close, there's a negative correlation between closing and sales success. We even know how much. It's 33% less. So you're going to sell 33% left if you keep badgering the customer about that. So if the product that you sell is below 110 bucks, then you can continue to ask and, and it will actually improve close ratios. But above that number, 
it will actually decrease your success ratio. So always be closing is easily to remember, but it's absolutely not true. <laughs> always um, be closing, number one. Yeah. Another one is uh, what I was just mentioning is that people think that these closing tactics apply whether the sale is big or whether it's small. And what Neil Rackham proved is that in his study of uh, over 35,000 face-to-face sales encounters is that once the deal gets above a certain size, the tactics that used to work don't work. And so when you force a person to make a, a decision, right? We're trying to put them in, in some area where they got to make a commitment. If the, the value or the risk of that commitment is low, then those closing tactics that put pressure on, they can actually increase sales. He measured it. It actually went up by about 4%. It's not a lot but it went up a little bit. But it above a certain amount, and the threshold that he tested in the 80s was only $109, okay? If any above that, once you use those closing tactics, it actually had a, a negative correlation. So the truth is that using those manipulative closing tactics on anything above 110 bucks is gonna backfire on you. And so the, the myth that you can use the same tactics is, is just isn't true. You have to use a very different approach when you're selling high-tech, B2B, multi-stage, complex selling. And do you see there is a vast difference between your approach in sales when we're talking about the deals that are up to $50,000, between 50 and 1 million, and then go up 1 million, 2 million. And in terms of you know, how the salesperson should behave or how mature the salesperson should be. So do you think that people with just experience, a few years experience, but they are talented, they write a lot of books, they know what they're doing, can close those multi-million deals or they need to be experienced in, in that regard and have a lot of failed calls. I don't think you have to fail a ton to be successful, if that's what you're saying. I do think that you can study. I'm an example of that. I went to school to learn a totally different thing and then ended up in sales. And then I've done that for the last 30 years. So I think that you can, it can be learned. It can be, it can be taught. So I, I would say that there is a threshold. Once you hit like 50,000 and there's multiple people, there's a very different set of skills that you have to have that just don't exist when you're selling something less expensive than that. And that's because there's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of risk involved. And so you have to make sure that it's a win for every single person that's involved in the process. And a classic book that I would recommend to almost anybody that's in complex selling is called Strategic Selling by Miller Mm -hmm. Hyman. And that book explains that companies don't buy things. People buy things. And that every person has a different opinion and a perspective of what's happening whenever you make a complex, when you're in a complex sale. And so what you actually have to do as a salesperson is you have to meet all those people and you have to figure out what their needs are. You have to make sure that their needs are going to get met by the solution and explain that to them so that everybody gets a win. And that makes the the process much more tedious than stuff that we might be used to over the telephone or where we're doing web-based selling where we might only have one or two encounters. Right. And do you think that the same logic where we're we see the trend that people buy more from people than from companies, right? Is led us to the point where we see that the influencers come in place and people start following more people and you need to build your own brand first and kind of invest in yourself, invest what you're doing, what your name is, so on and so forth. And then you build a, a product line or kind of a service line or you just then always have a client that are following you, where you go, what you do. And while hiring salespeople or interviewing salespeople, you need to look at how big the community is around your brand. Do you think that that's the true statement or? It's true that brand is important, but so also is your own personal brand. Just to give you an example of that, I've been in healthcare technology for 30 years or so. And I have sold in those 30 years, some of the same people three, four, five times in that time. And the reason is because once they understood that I, when I promised them that they were going to get the result that I promised, even if I had to go put some sweat equity in to do it, they trusted me and they knew that I would never bring something to them that that was not going to fail, that was going to fail. They, They knew I would not bring them something that was bad. And so what they were doing in that case, just like you said, Mike, is they're buying me, right? They're buying me as much as they're buying the product. I think it's really important important for anybody in sales to start building your personal brand now. And that means making sure that all the things that people see on the outward side of what you are is reflective of of who you are as a person. So you got to buff out your LinkedIn profile. You have to be on all the social networks and you have to be careful about what you put on Facebook. Don't ever do or say anything that you wouldn't want blasted all over the internet because that's the world we live in, right? right? 
And I'm okay with that. You should live every day with that if you, if you, yeah. if you ask me, right? Don't ever do anything, period, that you wouldn't want blasted over the internet. And that's probably a good moral for life. But those are important things because what the data shows is that people actually, before they meet with you, they actually look you up in the different social platforms to see what they're dealing with. And right. so that's an important place to start. And then, of course, you got to do good work for customers. If there's a shortcut in sales, then I would say it's just to do a great job for a client and have that client help you get other clients. And so that means you as an agent of your company promising and making good on your promise that you're going to deliver the results that you say you are. And that when you do that, all you got to do is record a before and after. Now you've got a case study and a happy customer and that customer will help you get more customers. And here's the challenge that I see. Sometimes when your pipeline is kind of is being split into several roles, right? When you have hunter or, and then you have a farmer, for example, or when you are closing deals and you're constantly focusing on bringing new clients, taking new calls, qualifying customers, and kind of moving them to closing. And then you have people like account managers or customer success managers that are making sure that the value that you spoke about to a client or that you evangelized can be met with by the team, by the delivery team, right? And the challenge that I see that sometimes when you're focusing, and I've seen that with my own example, when, I, when I'm focusing on my own pipeline, sometimes I just don't have time to attend to those people that, they are, that I already start building relationship with, right? So do you have any advice on how to solve that problem? Obviously, I think, for what I think, right, is that you can always add people on social, on LinkedIn, Facebook, like their photos, endorse their skills, sometimes send a quick message once, once a time saying, that, hey guys, how are you doing? Is everything all right with the team? Do you have any suggestions or feedback that I can incorporate or help you with? Something like that. But are there any other kind of modules that you can use in your working with customers after you already pass them over to your customer success team? Oh yeah. So in fact, a lot of managers might not like what I'm about to say. And I'm sure a ton of support people won't like what I'm about to say, but I'm, this is, has been a huge benefit to me as a personal salesperson. So first of all, when you create a relationship with a customer, it's your relationship and you make it that way forever. So do not ever hand off your relationship to someone else. There might be other people in your company that will do service and other things, implementation, training, maybe programming, all that kind of stuff. You still have the relationship with them. And you need that, by the way, because that relationship is very, very valuable over, over time. So if you're in sales for a career for a long time, you want to have that relationship with that person. And I'll give you an example. So I remember I was working in the West for NextGen Healthcare. And we were uh, selling organizations out here. But one of our clients that had had really great results was actually in Atlanta. And so I called this guy on the phone, right? And so instead of, and, and by the way, we had rules in our company. For whatever reason, the implementation support people are always worried that salespeople are going to ruin the relationship that we have with a client, okay? They're always worried about that. But that is not the tr- case. That is not the case. And I don't know why they're guardians of the clients like that, but they, they're, that is a real phenomenon. So what I did is I ignored all those rules. I called the client up on the phone. I said, and it was, this is their CEO I'm talking about. Man, I have heard great things about you guys. Tell me how you're doing it. What are you doing? And this guy spent about an hour with me on the phone telling me all the great stuff that they had done, the way that they had used our product to create all these great results. And then later, it wasn't that call, but it was later, I had a client clear over on the West Coast. And I said, hey, I asked the client, I said, hey, do you want to see, do you want to see someone closer? Do you want to see a place that's really doing it right? And they said, we want to go to the place that's doing it as good as can be done. I said, yeah. we should go to, we should go to Atlanta. Let's go talk to Jack Reed. So we jump on a plane, we go over there. And I, of course, I called Jack. Hey, can I, have, can I bring somebody else to see you? And he goes, yeah, of course. All because I reached out to him, created that relationship. And literally, I probably 50 to 80% of all the site visits I ever did, I convinced people to fly across the country to go see this one guy's site so they could see how great it was. And that's because I created the relationship with this guy. And we continued that. I mean, there are other things that we did to build the relationship. But the whole point of all this is this guy got that it was valuable to be able to help us as a company and me personally to bring people out to his place. Plus, it kind of was great on his ego. And so sometimes you'll bump into clients that actually have that mindset that understand that if I help this company, it also helps me. That kind of client, that is pure gold when they get yeah. that, right? There's other, there's other kinds of clients. There's clients that are takers, right? And they never, they never give back. But when you find someone that gets that, boy, that is, you better, you nurture that and never let that, never give that client relationship away to somebody else and stop 
So the idea that you're going to sell somebody and then just move on is not really a thing. I would just totally recommend against that. The whole uh, fire and forget type of uh, sale is not a good strategy if you're going to be in it for a career. If you, I've been in it for 30 yeah. years. And like I said, I sold many people products that are hundreds of thousands of dollars multiple times. And that's because that right. relationship is there and they trust you. So that was a long probably answer to what you said. But Break down those walls that your company puts with you and your clients. If there's a good customer within your client base and you've heard about them, reach out and create a relationship with that person because yeah. it'll be valuable to you. And here is the scenario for you. So you, you build this great relationship with the customer. You deliver them to your clients team that are making sure that the goals are met and they fail, right? Something happened, deadlines were passed, something wrong. Then clients reach out to you and saying that, hey, James, I want to seek your support because your team failed, right? And you say, John or Mike, I will take care of things. I will make sure that it works. But then the team failed again. So clients will not get back to you again, right? How would you solve that challenge? So what would you do if you see that it's just not happening? Would you be honest with the client and say, we don't want to lose your business, but it just doesn't work right now? Or have you had any... You always have to be 100% truthful and honest with your client. And what you're describing, I would say, in each case is very unique. You need to find out what it is that went wrong. Because sometimes, I mean, it, it's never true that if I implement a system, it's 100% success every time because the client has stuff they got to do on their side. And so often the thing that is going wrong is on the client side. They're not doing their job. And so they'll try to often push it on to the company and say that it's our responsibility that they're not doing their stuff. And that, of course, we know better than that. But we still suck it up on our side, right? Customer's yeah. always right. But if we have done the customer wrong and we fell short somehow, then we got to figure out a way to make that good. And so an important kind of problem-solving mindset is to have, well, what are they actually trying to do? What's the end game? So if a feature doesn't work, as long as we can get to their end result some other way, a workaround or some other strategy, well, then maybe that gives you latitude to try other things to solve the problem until we can get the way it's supposed to be doing working. I would say it's very situational, but you try to help the customer. You always own up to it. And then if it keeps happening over and over again, Mike, I would just say you need to take a close reflection about where you're working. Yeah. Because if, if you're not delivering, if you're working for a company and the rest of the team cannot deliver on our promises, then you got to go to a place where you can authentically and honestly tell customers with uh, integrity that they're going to get the results you promised. So if, if you're working for somebody where that's not the case and you're just selling vapor, I would get out of that as fast as you can. Okay. Well, because you're not selling wafers, right? So people who are selling wafers, they like, like their business. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, anyway, that is, if you want to be, if you want to enjoy sales, I mean, there's the, you don't want to be in those awkward moments where the customer calls you on the phone and says, hey, you lied to me, right? We don't want yeah. that. And the funny thing, it was just like a joke, right? Is you know, the difference between a car salesperson and a software salesperson is the car sales guy knows when he's lying. But in the software world, sometimes we think everything's working the way it's supposed to work. Everybody in the whole organization, and then finally when we get out to doing it, it doesn't work like we thought. And so those things will happen. But if it's happening a lot, you got to take a close look at where you're working, right? Because right. what will happen in the long run, believe it or not, is you will telegraph unintentionally your knowledge that you're, you're hurting the customer by selling. And so your, your, your success will totally plummet because there's a whole bunch of hidden messaging that takes place between two people. And salespeople will, just like that dog can smell fear, customers can tell when, when you're trying to fool them. It's so true. What I've also seen is that, you know, sometimes if you're not in software business, but if you are in, in service business or um, a managed service business, when you're dealing mostly with people, Sometimes when you're approached by customer, they want you to create the magic, right? They wanted you to solve all their problems. It's like, mm -hmm. I have this problem, solve me. And if you didn't solve me, then say, okay, you know, I paid you the money, and you didn't solve the problem. So suck up, right? And then you fail. And what I see a, a lot of times is that whenever companies that are dealing with other companies don't have that the same willingness to do their best, you know, to work hard, to grind, to change. And they just need a server pro, a service provider just to help them with their specific hard skills, right? I, I don't know marketing. I'm looking for a marketing agency, but it doesn't mean that I don't care about marketing and those guys will take care of the marketing. It just means that I need also to know about marketing. I, I want to change my marketing and those folks just help me out with some hard skills, right? With coding, with strategy or something, but I want this marketing. And that's, I think that a lot of time when companies fail, right? When you sell software, 
But from that side, no one cares about the software because they, they, they were not decision makers. They were right. just, you know, rejected that. And that's just the problem. So anyhow, I wanted to spend next 10 minutes talking about the perfect close and especially about the, the last chapter, the one where you summarize the seven easy steps for perfect closing. And I wanted to, with you while we was on this session to go one by one. And then if we can use a real example, for example, a facility or healthcare company, which we can sell to, right? And we can go and see which kind of tools you can use, you can advise to use. How would you do that preparation and how would you handle that? Just a, a very kind of high level, but with some kind of details. All right? And maybe it makes sense to tell, teach them what the perfect close is before we go through the... Yeah, the seven yeah. steps. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it maybe <laughs> makes sense. Sorry for that. Yeah, it makes sense. I was just, I think that I will put a, a link to the book and a short summary of the book. So anyone who will be listening to this can go and, and check out the book first and the summary and the idea. And then they will know for sure what we're talking about. But what I like with the book when, when I read, um, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't read the full book yet, but I got a, a very kind of close glimpse and what the book is about and what I like okay. specifically is that you are a practitioner. I like that you basically tell people what to do, what to not use, and what not to use. And it's great because this is actually something that companies like myself are looking for. If I have a sales team or SDR team, I want to have a, a guide at hand that I can send and say, hey, listen, this is the book that I want you to read. And then you need to follow that. So that, you know, because sometimes when you encounter books that on sales, these are books just about the methodologies, like you need to be this or you need to be not this, but they don't give a real example. Like this is what the phrase you need to use. This is what sentence you need to use. And this is what I see, you know, how great the book that you wrote is specifically in those, you know, details of the conversation that you can have with the book and knows that you can take because you can basically scan the book and put it on the, on the wall and just mm-hmm. use those, right? It's, so yeah, that's it, wonderful. It, it's that easy. So I don't know if you want to start with the closer or you want to start with the, the steps. The first step of you know, any encounter is to do a little homework about your client and to research your client before you get there. So researching your client, right? So let's imagine, uh, so we are selling a software for hospitals, right? For example, and we have a hospital, St. Mary Hospital in Salt Lake City, right? That we want to, to work with. And we have a software like a, a patient, doctor's management, management system, right? If we do the client's research, which, what do you start with, right? What tools do you go to? What links, what websites do you check to, to get information about what this meeting will be about or what your client is? Yeah, so I would say at, uh, in terms of where to do the exact research, that's going to be a little bit industry specific. Of course, the obvious places that you can go to is their website. If we use the hospital example like you did, the hospitals will have certain news announcements. So they may have new buildings that they're building. They may have new insurance plans that they're offering. They may have new special technology that they purchase to treat cancer, things like that. And so those things all tell you something about what that organization is trying to do as a whole and even departmentally, because we might be selling to just one department within a, a really large organization. But other industries, you know, uh, you can go to Bloomberg, you can go to different sources to look at, like uh, in, the, in the healthcare space, we have a, a database called Definitive and it tells mm-hmm. us a whole tons of different things ar- about the hospital, it tells us how many beds they have, all the departments, how much money that they did last year and, and things like that. And so we can get a, a picture of what's happened to that organization. Are they in growth mode? Are they in crisis mode? Are they losing market share? Are they acquiring clinics or are they selling off? All those things tell us a little bit about what's happening with the customer. And that is different for every client. Now, that's the core organization. We also need to research the individuals within our organizations as well. And so... Who are we meeting with? We'll, mm-hmm. Obviously, the places to look up for them, or we're going to look them up on LinkedIn or Navigator if you don't want them to see that you visited their profile. But we can look them up on Facebook. Of course, they, if you're an executive, they, they could easily be listed on the website as a leader within the organization. And you can see that on there. And we can see you know, interesting things like their hobbies, but we can also right. see where, where they came from. Like in LinkedIn, we can see, oh, this guy came from this lab company or this other place. So he's going to know about this kind of stuff. Other people might have come from outside the industry and they might not be very educated about certain things. And so that tells you a little bit about, but the whole point of doing the research is so that you can have sort of a value hypothesis of how you're going to be able to help these guys. And that's really what the second step is, is knowing 
what your value prop is. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to transition to that, but I work with a lot of different organizations around the country and they'll bring me in to, to look at prospecting or they'll bring me in to look at closing or something like that. But I tell you about 80% of the time when we get to figuring out what the problem really is, almost 80% of right. cases, it's that they haven't developed a value proposition for all the stuff that they're starting trying to sell. Right. And I'm just blown away by that. But if you don't know your own value proposition, what are the odds that you and your team and your client are ever going to know what that value proposition is too? Right? It's so hard with value proposition. Why companies don't do that? Why don't they focus on this? Is that like, they know what they're selling. They know what value they can bring to their clients, right? But do they just don't know how to summarize that, put that in the nice flow of, you know, of, of language or... I would say the first problem is that they're product centric. They think uh -huh. about their product. They don't think about the results their product creates. And that's what customers buy, right? Customers do not buy your product. They don't give a rip about your product. They only care about the result that the product produces. And so if your product could be all kinds of different things, but if it produces the right result, they'll, t they'll buy it. Okay. So it's not about the product, but customers, organizations tend to get really centric on their, on their product itself, especially engineers, the people who make the products because it's their baby. So they love it. They love the product. But we got to get off of that. You got to think, oh, what kind of result does this produce? And what most organizations have never done is that they've never put enough rigor into looking at the results that it actually produces for clients that they can never say that we were able to improve accounts receivable for such and such organization by 10 to 60%. They don't know that. And so they know it does generally prove an make create an improvement of some kind, but they never quantify it. I mean, and if, if you're selling something for 100 bucks, people will gamble hey, I'll pay 20 bucks on the off chance that it might work. But if you're selling something for millions of dollars, you cannot do that. You have to be able to articulate exactly how much money you're going to be able to do because some CFO somewhere up the food chain is going to have to say yes or no to this big investment. And so people just don't spend nearly enough time understanding what their value props are. Plus, in addition to having a value prop, you should have little stories that articulate the value prop for every single value prop that you have so that you can say, yeah, we're able to improve the, the referral revenue for this organization by $2.8 million within an eight-month period. And then we tell the story about how we did it and where they started and how they got there and the mistakes that they made and the things that they did right. And, and then the customer starts to not just understand the metric, but they see the how it happens, how we get there, right? And I call that the mechanism of action. Right. But that's how... And so people don't spend nearly enough time on that. I got to tell you, over and over again. And once you have created these very tight value props and mm -hmm. these little stories salespeople will be armed to go out to market and have these conversations with people. What I find is that they'll just say, here's the people we want you to go after. Here's our product brochure. Go get them. They never teach anybody how to have a conversation about how the stuff works. I see that problem so over powerful. and over again. Yeah. yeah, it's so powerful. So let me put, uh, you know, let me uh, kind of put this into context and, and give like our value proposition and research as an example, right? So if my ideal customer profile are businesses that are up to 500 employees size, they have existing sales team, five, 10 people, right? And they are actively, for example, hiring SDRs, right? Or they don't have enough SDRs and, and they have their average product uh, kind of sales size or uh, mm -hmm. sales sub price at uh, $500,000 or $200,000, something like that, right? And what I do... I go to a company LinkedIn page. I go to the company page. And when you, uh, when you buy this navigator, right, you see their analytics. You see how they're growing, what's their team distribution, right? The breakdown of how many salespeople they have. And then when you see that, okay, they have like 10 salespeople and then they have like two people in business development, right? And then you go to their website, you see their value proposition, their team structure, everything. And then you can see, okay, so... Those guys have a sales team, but they don't have a, a BDR team. So they're probably utilizing other channels, like the referral channel, maybe advertising content. You go to their blog, right. you see they're utilizing content strategy. So, okay, so you, you write this down, right? You see how many salespeople they have. And then when you go to, you know, you go to on the call with a client and you, you know, you have this short story, like, for example, you can say, okay, guys. And then, by the way, I forgot to add this, but you also go and see if they're hiring an SDR, you can see how many positions are open for the SDR in their area, right? And how long they've been open. So you can see that if the position was open for the last like six months, that they have challenge in, in closing that position. So they are struggling, right? 
So when you go on the call and say, okay, guys, so you have 10 people, salespeople, and you have two BDRs, what kind of marketing channels you're utilizing? And they would say, well, we do this and this and content. Do we do outbound? They say, yeah, we do outbound. And how, what kind of outbound? You say, well, we have BDRs that are supplying the appointments or leads to my sales team, right? And you say, you know, we have 10 salespeople and two BDRs and you've been struggling with hiring another BDR, right? What if my team steps in and we're going to deliver you that many appointments for that cost that would help your salespeople to be 25% more effective or they will be able to close twice more deals. And if you put that into perspective and start calculating the numbers, and it would say that your average deal size is about $100,000, right? And your salespeople are closing about two deals per quarter, for example, right? And for that, to close that kind of two deals, you know, you need like 10 appointments or 10 leads from the client, right? So your closing percentage is like 20%, 20%. right? 20%. And we say that how many leads you get. You say, okay, we, we, we get like seven leads, right? So if you were able to get them additional 10 leads, that would result in, you know, in 200,000 more in revenue per quarter, which is, you know, for example, like $50,000 or $100,000 per month, right? And you invest into that like $5,000 or $10,000. And would that fit in your acquisition cost? What I've seen is that when you talk this language, right? When you start kind of putting that into perspective, the research that you did, plus the takeaways and as well as kind of want to talk numbers, right? Okay, this is the value that I want to bring to you based on this information. Is that about right? It's different from just learning about the company, the pitch, the presentation, and that's it, right? And I've seen that a lot of salespeople, especially in the United States, and I don't know why, they have that strategy, right? They have a strategy to jump on the call, do the pitch, share the screen, learn about the business, just listen to you know, how the other side is talking, 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 and then go do your talk, and then, okay, so are we doing this or not? And I've seen that this kind of mindset that I've developed and the pitch that I've developed is very characteristic for being a, a business owner or being a person that delivers the value because you want to put the numbers. You want to kind of say, okay, this is what we have. This is what you do. How would you comment that? Would you, would you add something else on this? What well, am I doing wrong? What you're just, no, what you're, what you're describing is you have a perspective as a business owner and you speak to another company person as an investor and, and the return that you produce, right? And so you see it in the way that they see it. So that's the thing that's missing with a lot of these young BDRs in the US is they are product focused and they're saying, oh, well, what I want to do is I want to ask them about the things that relate to my product and then I want to convince them to see my product and then I'm going to show them my product. And yet we've all missed the results that we're trying to produce. When you focus on the result that we're trying to produce, it actually opens up your options as a salesperson dramatically. I've been in many, many situations where the customer's overall goals and the results that they needed to produce could only be handled, maybe I can only handle about 60% of that, which left right. another 40% that needs to be done by someone else. What that means is I can bring in a partner, I can bring in, other, I can, I can bring in internal resources to that company. There's lots of ways of solving the problem. The goal is to be committed to solving the actual problem the customer's goal is, you know, what they're trying to actually do or the result they're trying to produce. And part of that might involve you, but part of that might involve others. And it will surprise you. They don't care. They don't care that you're bringing in another person. In fact, they're grateful that you're doing their homework so that you can create a complete solution for them. So when you sell that way, you've got a lot more latitude. And then, then you're thinking more about just uh, helping them accomplish a goal or solve a problem than you are about selling your stuff. Right. And so you need to be able to walk into any conversation thinking, if I'm not the right fit, I'm not going to do business with these guys. And I'm going to point them towards the person I think is the greatest fit. That's having integrity. And people will sense that. They sense it in your voice. It's called parallel language. They sense it in your micro expressions when you're face to face with them in your body language. And so uh, when you're authentic that way, they'll want to do business with you. And what the data shows is they'll even pay a premium for the services with you. So what you described was awesome because you can articulate the actual value that you bring and how it fits into an organization. Very often, especially for organizations that have multiple products, they'll invent a brand new product and no one has done any. They've never even done a, what's called a problem inventory. They don't even know the problems really. They have an idea of the problem that it solves, but they've never done a complete list of the, of the problems that they actually solve for the client. And that's your target market. The people that have those problems are the people you can sell to. And sometimes that will allow you to sell to other markets you never even dreamed you could sell to because you understand what the problem is that you solve. And so anyway, you did many things right with there, but also you also identified your ideal client. And that's another thing that, um, you know, I wrote a book on closing, but if you ask me what's the best way to improve your closing ratio, I would say 
it's not to use my, my, my magic clothes. I would say it's to sell to only ideal customers. That's the best thing is don't waste your time on people that can never buy your stuff. That will improve your close ratio faster than anything else you can possibly think of. But so many organizations never sit down and take the time and think, what, who, what does our ideal customer look like? And what you know, here's also a challenge. I know there's a lot of you know, tools and platforms right now, like, like Zoom Info, Apollo, any automatic scrapers, databases, aggregators, any uh, kind of uh, tool or company that want to automate the sales process. And we know that all of us like to be more efficient with what we're doing and, and, mm. and had better exposure. They actually kill this idea of being very targeted, being account-based, working with your ideal customer, right? So what I see a lot of the time is that when I want to build my sales process and I'm always looking for the best customer acquisition costs, right? So what kind of tools and sources I can utilize to, to make it cheap, right? to get more clients and get more margins, right? Or more sales, for example. And what I see is that what I do, I buy Sales Navigator, for example. I buy a tool that helps me to go through the leads and put together a spreadsheet with all the leads and then connect that via a tool like Zapier to a, a tool that is outreach.io that, and then send an email and then send a massive email, right? And then I can expect some results. And that actually created a problem where... I'm emailing everyone, I'm talking to everyone, but I don't know who my ideal customer profile is and that harms my sales, right? It's so easy to scale now that you just go for everybody instead of going for the, the ideal customer. Exactly, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, another thing that you, that you said in there, I don't know, you probably didn't, I mean, I love dissecting uh, the, your little, your value prop segment there, is that you said, well, these guys have this and they have this and that probably means this, right? You said that. And so what that is, is that's insight, right? And so that helps you identify a, a hypothetical value prop for the customer. So just knowing numbers, just knowing numbers of beds or number of companies or how many employees they have or how much revenue they did last year. Yes, we can get that infinitely from, from database products, but the yeah. psychographics is different, right? That comes from the human part of it. And, yeah. Or like in your case, some experience. You're like, oh, whenever I see a customer that does this, this, and this, they always have this problem. Yeah. And so that tells us when on our call with them, because we perhaps say, hey, I'm curious. I was working with a client that looked just like you guys. They did this, this, and this, and this. Are you guys experiencing anything like this? And that's the moment that the person on the other end feels understood. And they go, yes, are you kidding me? You get me. We're totally experiencing that problem. And I've seen that you can use the same methodology in your email, right? So you can find 100 companies that are just similar to the client that you work with. And then you can send an email, hi guys, I feel like you are very, you have the same business model like these guys and they have this challenge and this is how we solve them. Do you guys experience something like that? And that's the best gold email, right? Because it then is a, if you... Yeah, that is a very great script, right? Yeah. You, you guys look like somebody we helped. Here's what we did for them. Does it, you know, uh, do, do you think that does this makes sense for us to attack for 20 minutes, right? right? That right. kind of a... And yeah. also to give you a real example, and this is super interesting, as I kind of, uh, talk, uh, kind of talking to with experience, I had like probably like 500 calls with different owners of um, software development companies, right? And what I've seen and the pattern is super interesting is that when the owners or founders of the software company are technical people, right? So they are engineers, and the team is about 50 to 100-ish, 150 people. And if you go to their LinkedIn page and they don't have salespeople, right? Most of their sales come from the referral channel. And you've tried outbound, for example, and it didn't work for you. And they say, yes, we tried. It didn't work for me, right? And then we say, okay, why, why it didn't work for you? And they say, well, because we sent 100 emails and we received two responses and that's it. And then we failed. Because... You know, when you are receiving leads from the channels like referral channels, organic, your network, you know, it's, it's easier to sell, right? So if you were, Jeff, J James, to go to a client that you already work with and you have this great solution and you just introduce the solution and say, hey, guys, I think there's a fit there. I say, okay, James, send us the contract, right? Let's kind of see where we are there. And it's different from where you knock the door and say, okay, this is the solution that we have. Are you interested? And say, well, we, want, we, we can take a look, right? And this is a total different sales model. You need to be more proactive. You need to be more proactive. You need to be more kind of aggressive. You need to, be, to show more enthusiasm from your side. And you want it to solve their problem. You want it to get their business, right? Rather than just being reactive there and saying that, okay, this is what we do. Are you interested? No. Okay, we move on. There, right? 
Yeah, you're making a good point here that I'm mean, just to simplify what you just said. There's really two kinds of sales. There's responding to demand and then there's creating demand. And they're very different types of sales. One, if someone calls you or your friend says, hey, this looks interesting. Well, that's easy. You just say, hey, well, tell me what you're trying to do, right? That's an easy sale. It's when someone who doesn't know that they have a problem or could be benefited from you, you have to sell the chance to sell, <laughs> right? And so that's a very different type of sale. People don't, they start to, they think that all kinds of selling is the same. And the truth is responding to demand or working your network is a wholly different kind of, of selling that by the way is very, is tough to scale compared to outbound where yeah. your messaging has to be tight. You have to be able to explain to them why they could benefit, even if they don't know about you. And I'm working with a company now that only 20% of the market uses something like what they have. Yeah. And so people aren't even aware of what's possible. And so uh, sometimes when we describe what's possible, they think, wow, that's, I, I didn't even know that technology had got to the point where something like that is even a possibility. And in some cases they say, is it even legal? <laughs> so, but that's good, right? That's good. It's just that with them not being aware you're never going to get demand, right. right? If they're not aware of the solution that you have, you're never going to get demand. You're going to have to go reach out and tell them sure. about the possibility. Sure. And that's a very different kind of sale. I've seen that companies that started with outbound that were good in, that became good in outbound and they knew how to articulate the message, how to streamline your pipeline, how to kind of measure each and every deal and how you can squeeze that and making those first mistakes and building actual sales by outbound are much more efficient and successful with their organic sale down the road just because they already made those first mistakes. And it's, uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's opposite to the companies that see this first organic boost, right? They have those users, the acquisition was great. But then when they hit the wall and they don't know what to do, it's like, okay, the conversion is falling, the customers are falling, we don't know what to do. And they, they invest like, you know, a year or two years in building that outbound, uh, outbound channel. And they expect the same results that they had with organic. They expect the same conversion. They expect the same closing. And any agency that they are hiring or any external consultants or people that are brought, I, I, I saw multiple examples of companies that are hiring this great VP of sales, great head of sales, and they failed for six months and then they let them go and look for mm -hmm. a, a better, right? A better professional or something. So the point that I was trying to make is that if you're a company that are doing great with outbound, don't just focus on outbound. Grow your marketing, grow your content, try to utilize those channels because the outbound is a temporary thing. You cannot you know, build your business just on outbound, right? Whereas the companies that are great in inbound also do the outbound. Because if you, if you kind of you know, don't do outbound, don't get on and proactively look for new businesses, for bigger deals, for new buying windows, you will stagnate at, at one point of the time in the future and then you will be in trouble because you will not would not know how to do. And if you, you are in trouble, then try to understand that the channels are different and that you need to fail at least one or two or three times. And it's not just about the people that you hired. It's also about how you position yourself, what your value proposition is. And as you said, and supporting your point that the, comp, the, the, the sales are super different when you're dealing with organic traffic, with organic networking and, and people coming to you. And then when you are coming to people and offering your business. So it's a multi multifaceted problem and you cannot, it's, it's not, but what you say is so common, right? Hire someone we expect, Oh, they're going to turn us around in six months. And if they don't turn us around in six months, we are off into the next guy. But I see clients that will do that year after year, after year, after year. <laughs> right. So uh, that's a, that's a, t a challenge. So, wow, we've covered a lot of ground here. So we, the we first, probably will not be yeah. moving to the, the next <laughs> point, right? I kind of to wrap things up, right, James? Can you give a kind of a, a one minute elevator pitch, a quick summary, who will be reading the book, who can benefit from it and what they can learn from it, right? What the main takeaway that they can learn from the book? Sure. So honestly, uh, almost everybody I've had compliments from folks that are brand new to sales all the way to have been in sales for decades have uh, told me that uh, they benefited from the book because while the book sounds like it's all about closing, the truth is it's about sales process and about doing that in an authentic way. Definitely the two questions that are the perfect close uh, are very helpful. It's just, like I said, two questions, zero pressure and non-confrontational. And it will advance your sale literally 90 to 95% of the time. So you'll just have a nice, steady, slow uh, advancing of your sale. So anybody who can benefit from that kind of a process, I would say the folks that will benefit the least from uh, the perfect close are those who are in a, a, a single encounter type sale. The perfect close is more about making sure that momentum takes place in every single encounter. And that generally lends itself to more complex B2B types of sales. 
that's what I think can benefit from it. Uh, they're certainly welcome to, they can try it out by going to the website. Uh, right on the website, they can download the first three chapters so they can get a feel of what it's like. And then there's a whole ton, there's a, more than a dozen different t- tools and resources there that they can download for free as well. And that could give them an idea of whether or not it's for them. But uh, so what's I, the website? Can you spell the website for us? It, it, yeah, it is puremuir.com, P U R E M U I R.com. And, and you uh, can also, also go to Amazon and buy it from yeah. Amazon. So the Kindle version is four ninety nine, and the paperback is $14.30 or so. And so this is going to be a Black Friday soon, right? So probably <laughs> discounts on Amazon. That's right. That's right. Actually, should we, we should do something for your listeners, right? Just to listen to this podcast. And you uh, tag Mike and me in a, either a tweet or you can post it on LinkedIn that you heard this podcast. Tag us both. And for the first five people that do that, and so the reason you're tagging us is so we can notice. I'll, yeah. send, you, I'll send you a free copy of the audiobook. I'll just send okay. you a link. You can download the Audible book. So how about that? You can't beat that. That's, that will reward you for listening to Mike's podcast. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. That's it's amazing. And definitely, probably some of my folks here will listen to this and <laughs> reach out to link it in. So <laughs> it doesn't work to Belkins and please though. Right? You guys can have it. Just send, yeah. me, just send me their email address. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to order books and we put in our library we collect a lot of books so we are gigs so uh okay jim so i appreciate your time it's been great i know that uh, we can stretch this this session for a few more hours and i think we could have gone on forever yeah uh, yeah yeah <laughs> so i appreciate your time you and your family have happy thanksgiving and we will stay connected okay sounds great mike we hope you've enjoyed this episode of belkin's growth podcast and found it useful Be sure to subscribe and catch upcoming episodes on iTunes and Stitcher.